I'd like us to open up our Bibles. I have mine here, but it's all unfolded here. I'll just wait for my wife to sit down. <laughs> Again, this is a continuation, and we're closing with this today. Before we do so, I need your help, Joe. I just need some extra water in there. Thank you. Again, title of this is Wives. Yeah, yeah it's on. It's on. But you know what? I'm, I'm OCD. It's like a little bit of an angle this way. I need to just do that maybe. That's a bit better. Okay. Again, the continuation. But a message on why submit? You gotta be kidding. <laughs> Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22. And again, this is not a very popular portion of Scripture. There's a number of, of uh, Scriptures that are not very popular. Another one is concerning the strange woman. Her feet abideth not in her house. A lot of women who are out of order. A lot of men who are out of order. Or a lot of men who are limp wristed. That's a whole different topic. It's one of my favorite terms now, limp wristed. <laughs> it's true though, wasn't it? There's something about it, like just quite off. You know? didn't quite <laughs> they quite do the job. <laughs> Yeah, I, I described the fire alarm that went off in the ball as a limp wristed fire alarm. <laughs> Ephesians 5, verse 22, we're going to start. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Heavenly Father, once again, I come before thy throne of grace. I give thee thanks, Lord, for thy word, for this portion of Scripture. I give thee thanks, Lord, for the created order, Lord, and the order that thou hast created. It is the perfect order, Lord, and if only we would abide by thy order, Lord, things would be a lot more harmoniously, we'd live more peacefully, Lord. Lord, and uh, Lord, nevertheless, Lord, I ask that thou wouldst give me once again the unction to preach this. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's go here. So the question is asked, why is the wife supposed to submit to her husband's leadership? Why? Why? Well, the answer is that God has given the husband the responsibility of headship. For he is the head of the wife and home. That is God's structure of authority in the home. Christ, husband, wife, and then children. Society's got it backwards. And if you've seen in the third Adam series, what's, what the world has done is they removed Christ, and they removed the children, and they've elevated the wife on par. And it's more of an egalitarian relationship rather than a complementarian relationship. Well, anything a man can do, I can do. And even better. And I'll admit, probably there are some preachers' wives that are, would make better preachers than their husbands. But you know what? God hasn't called her. So we looked at a wife. The first point was a wife who is, who is submitted to her husband will first be submitted unto the Lord. That was the first point. The second point is a wife who is submitted to her husband will recognize his headship. Indeed, verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. You see, verse 23 explains the four for verse 22. For the husband is the head of the wife. Indeed. I would like us to note that Paul does not say that the husband ought to be the head of his wife, but rather the husband is the head of his wife. In other words, this is not an option. 
There's not a get out clause here. Your headship as a husband is a God-ordained role. Indeed. This is the created order. Now John Gill writes, The man is first in order in being, was first formed, and the woman out of him, who was, for, who was made for him, and not he for the woman, and therefore must be head and chief, as he is also with respect to his superior gifts and excellencies. That ain't popular, is it? Indeed. As strength of body and endowments of mind, a couple hundred years ago, they knew better. Now you've got men uh, swimming with women, posing as women, who are literally blowing them out of the water. They're even getting into those MMA fights and literally like giving them concussions. <laughs> Ladies, in general, men are exponentially stronger than you. That's how God built us. Why? Because we're built for labor. David and I were talking about he has a new job. And he enjoys the, the labor behind it. Indeed. Indeed. I was telling him, I'd like for my children to learn a trade. Absolutely. I wish I would have, looking back. A strength of body and endowments of mind. Whence the woman is called the weaker vessel. You are. Likewise, with regard to preeminence or government, the man is the head. And as Christ is the head of the church, and the church is subject to him, so the husband is the head of the wife. And she is to be subject to him in everything, natural, civil, and religious. Moreover, the man is the head of the woman to provide and care for her. Key point. To nourish and cherish her and to protect and defend her against all insults and injuries. Amen. And this is one reason that I want men to really evangelize, especially in hostile environments. Ladies, you don't want, as, as, as Brother Luke eloquently um, stated, an AIDS-infested sodomite spitting on you. And otherwise, you're going to have to contact, uh, contact GMBC and associates for some counsel. <laughs> if Mrs. Lamore won't, won't get that. Well, I don't think any of you, have, well, we were accused basically of having, like, all being part, a number of our members of our church being part of the same law firm. So that we can go, basically, what, what it is, we'll be assaulted, then we can make money from that. <laughs> I don't know where these people dream this stuff up. I'm trying to think, okay, well, then I went on the air. I have to look up the law firm, maybe. Maybe there's a, there is a Jacob A. Sapochnik with an H, not an I. They're a very similar name. Uh, but it's an easy immigrant, or at least the, the law firm's an immigration law firm in San Diego. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, they're probably that dumb to even believe that, too. I'm telling you, <laughs> they're crazy. They're obsessed, Archie. They're absolutely obsessed. Indeed. See, the husband's headship is, stated, is a stated fact, not a command. It's a stated fact. I want us to know that Paul does not say that the hus husband ought to be the head of his wife, but rather the husband is the head. The Bible declares it as a stated fact. Some husbands are weak and affected, ineffective, effeminate, and just plowsy head, playing lousy heads of their wives, but they are still in that position of authority. Weak, ineffective, and effeminate. I'm getting all tongue twisted here. But nevertheless, God has ordained that position, that role for the husband. I understand many, many men, and I'm talking about Christian men, fail as the head of the home. They're checked out. Now in the secular world, most fail. Most. I mean, now some have been so effeminated that literally, and I like the way David points out, sir, he sees things I don't see, and it's kind of true. You, you look, if you look closely, he says, at the couples downtown, you'll see the husband and then the wife 
And like he's constantly looking at her. It's almost like for approval. And she's like, you know, like pushing the stroller, chest back, and you know. And that's uh, that's a keen observation because I I notice that as well. Men are limp wristed today. Now uh, here's what this man says. Meditating on this is a very valuable thing for husbands to do. Because the husband is the head of the wife, he finds himself in a position of inescapable leadership. He cannot successfully refuse to lead. If he attempts to abdicate in some way, he may, through his rebellion, lead poorly. But no matter what he does or where he goes, he does so as the head of his wife. This is how God designed marriage, indeed. This is not popular. No. A lot of these liberal churches, I guarantee you, it's not popular. Well, they'll take verse 21, misinterpret it, misapply it. Well, we are to submit to each other. My husband submits to me as I submit unto him. That does not how, that's not order. I don't submit in the workplace unto my boss and then expect him to submit under my authority. Right? He doesn't ask me to go sweep the back, sweep the back of receiving. I go and sweep, by the way, I sweat receiving, but I need you now to run the... Uh, Run, run the scrubber down the dock, right? right? No, he's going to tell me to run the scrubber. Or if he's going to run the scrubber, he's going to let me know that he's running the scrubber so I can do something else that he's told me to do. We don't submit unto each other. There is an order of authority. Even in the secular world, there's a hierarchy. Now, obviously, in the Bible, it's not the same as the world. I understand that. In the faith, we're all equal, including the pastor. But God has ordained offices. See, the fact of the husband's headship, which is analogous to Christ's headship over the church, has at least two implications. And the first of which is, headship means that, headship means that there are gender-based roles in marriage as ordained of God. There are only two. No, <laughs> they are. <laughs> we pre <laughs> to this day, I cannot imagine that there will ever be a day where I'll be out preaching. There are only two genders. And not only say, state that as fact, but people, that's it. You know what? He really got me there. You know, I was already upset. But when he stated that there are only two genders, that was it. That was the last straw for me. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That, like, that was the last straw for me. That was it. That was it. You know, I was already riled up. I had enough. Like, my, you, you can literally see the smoke uh, uh, beaming out of my ears. But when he said there are only two genders, I lost it. I absolutely lost it. <laughs> wow. So the fact of the husband's headship means that there are gender-based roles in marriage. Indeed. While there is a sense in which all believers submit to one another, there is in another sense, there is another sense in which wives submit to their husbands. But husbands do not submit to their wives. It is significant that whenever the New Testament addresses the subject of marriage, it always commands the wife to be subject to her husband. But it never, never commands a husband to be subject to his wife. Not one instant. Search the scriptures, you will not find it. Colossians 3.18 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. That's a parallel verse. To verse 22 of Ephesians. You see, the word submit... A command, an imperative, means to put oneself in rank under another. The same Greek word, hupotasso, is also translated as obedient in Titus 2.5 and subjection in 1 Peter 3.1. And I'd like us to turn to those two verses or the, those two portions of Scripture. Titus 2 and verse 5, although I'd like us to start in verse 3 and 1 Peter 3 and verse 1.
Titus 2, verses 3 through 5. Verse 5 is obviously the focus here. Are we there? All right. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Really just pay attention to each word here. Not false accusers, not giving them much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women. So, uh, you know, those of you who are a little bit older here, right, the elder or the aged women, keep, just take heed here, are you fulfilling this, that they may teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. Oh, I wish there were more women like this, discreet. Women are loud. You saw them there yesterday who were at the forefront coming against the preacher. They weren't the men. They were the women. Loud mouth, leather lung, Berthas. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient. Hopatasso. The same word translated submit to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. Poof. You know, ladies, if you've failing with this, young women, if you're not a keeper at home, this is why I don't believe it's an option, really. You're actually blaspheming the word of God. Wow. 1 Peter 3.1 Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection, Papatasso, to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. And as we know, conversation does not speak of rhetoric, but of manner of living. Your godly Christian lifestyle. In other words, they're going to see Jesus Christ in you. They're going to see that meek and quiet spirit. They're going to see that spirit is willing to submit to their ungodly husband because they are already in submission to the Lord. Or maybe their backslidden husband. Now, furthermore, all of, of all the or all of the New Testament commands, rather, for wives to submit to their husband are specifically addressed to the wives. Gentlemen, keep, take note. All of the New Testament commands for the wives to submit to their husbands are specifically addressed to the wives, not to the husbands. The, ne the Bible never commands a husband to command his wife to submit or demand that his wife submit to him. That is not your role. We're not Muslims here. We're not dictators. I'm not going to be beating my wife into submission. If you're a Muslim, you can, based on Surah 4 and verse 34. Absolutely. Now, they'll, 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 they'll modify it uh, to beat her lightly if it is useful, right? If it is useful, you can beat her lightly. Now, I don't know what the alternative is to that. If it's not useful, do you beat, do you beat her to a pulp? <laughs> right? Right? <laughs> right? If it's, not if it's not useful, do you beat her to a pulp? No. And they call us the misogynists? Yeah, exactly. Wow. So the Bible never commands a husband to demand his wife submit, that she submit. Rather, the headship of the husband is a fact, and the wife is to respond to the Lord who designed marriage in this way by willingly, ladies take note, willingly submitting to her husband. This is not a culturally determined role that we are free to discard since it doesn't fit our culture. And our culture says no, but the Bible says yes. See, God could have created Adam and Eve at the same time, at the same instant, by speaking the word, but He did not. He created Eve out of Adam. The man first and then the woman. There is a distinct order, a God-ordained order. And from this fact, Paul asserts in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 9, For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. The feminists won't like that. Essentially, she was to be a helper suitable for him, to assist him in his God-given tasks. 
So the roles in marriage are not culturally determined. They're never culturally determined, but rather ordained by God at the creation. For God hath spoken. See, Satan has inverted and also conflated all of this. Right? He inverts the order, and then he creates like a, a merging in the one. We saw that yesterday. Yeah. I, 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 I have to think God brings his people our way for a specific purpose. I know he gives me thousands of illustrations. Just tell me, literally, have, there's no shortage of, of illustrations for sermons, given what the topics we're talking about. Yesterday, we decided to go, you know, draw, do what, like, uh, like our guerrilla evangelism. We do a, we draw, park the van, and I put the speaker out, direct the, and <laughs> lo and behold, there was a man. How many children do you have? Two? I guess so. I think two children. And I'm assuming that's his wife. I don't know if it's a common law, but I'll just say it's his wife for sake of, uh, you know, the illustration here. Well, he was wearing a pink dress. Actually, it wasn't a dress. What it was was like a negligee. What, like what, what, what my wife, although not she doesn't, but what my wife, ought to, what my wife would wear in the confines of our bedroom, if you will. Pink, lace, black lace, pink dress. And I called him effeminate. <laughs> right? I said, you're, you're effeminate. Look at that. Oh, look at my natural reaction. Look, like, I just out of nowhere. Oh, look at this. Pink dress. You're effeminate. And he's getting upset. You're calling me effeminate in front of my children? And I'm thinking, you know what? You being called effeminate right now in front of your wife and children or children is the least of your issues. Okay? <laughs> That's the least of your issues right now. Look what you're wearing in public. This is what like women wear to, you know, or wife would wear to bed, a young woman would wear to bed for her husband. <laughs> I'm not going to, I mean, he obviously he responded very profanely too. Which, I mean, they all, they all respond the exact same way. It's a very, it's a, it's, it's a predictable response. Wow. Like, his main problem is that, that, that I actually called him out for being effeminate. You've got to, like, what, what, am I going to undermine your authority here? You've already done that, yeah. okay? Like, walking around in a, in a pink, whatever, pink. Then he had another one with a pink T-shirt, an older gentleman, too, and a pink kilt. <laughs> then he had that judge-looking thing with this... this uh, this uh, row, huge rosary, and then he's doing mm, in front of our van and going in front of my van. Mm. <laughs> wow. I, I, I'm just taking it back. Like, you're concerned about being called feminine, and like, you're made, that's not your major problem right now. You got, like, that's, that's hardly an issue. Your issue is like, just. Look in the mirror for a moment and just examine yourself. Or just look in the mirror. Now, God gives us a degree of liberality concerning specific issues or duties, rather, in a household. He does. He does give a degree of liberality. Obviously, they're within the confines of, within the confines of what the Word of God dictates. But nevertheless, there are liberality. Just like there liber there's liberality within the, church, the local church itself. But the role of the husband as head and wife as, a, as subject to him are fixed. They're non-negotiable. God hath spoken. Just as Christ's headship over the church means that he is an authority over the church for her good, so the husband has authority over his wife for her good. Indeed. Headship here is speaking of authority. As Christ has authority over his church in like manner, husbands have authority over their wives. Ephesians 1.22, And he hath put all things under her feet and gave him to be, that's Jesus, to be the head of all things, over all things to the church. 
and he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Now the, the God-ordained biblical order of authority is clearly borne out in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 and I would like us to turn to that verse. I'd like us all to turn there. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 and I want you to turn your Bibles, people. As Dr. Lamar used to say, it's not written on my forehead, son. There are a lot of churches now that don't have you flip through the scriptures. Now I have it in bolded here, just to let you know. Some have it up on the big screen. Faithway, you don't have to bring your Bible to Faithway. They'll just have it up on the big screen here. I don't believe in that. Because you know what? It makes people lazy. But I would have you know that the head of every man is who? Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Indeed. Biblical authority is never given for the advantage of the one in authority or so that he can dominate those under authority. There is to be no sense of dictatorship here. Indeed. Some suppose that Christian men get this wrong. Any? There are men out there who demand their wives submit. I never demand that my wife submit. Now praise the God, she, she is a godly wife who does submit. But I'm not to demand. I pray. You ought to pray. Now I'm looking at, I'm looking at Andrew, but I'm not thinking that's the baby lens complete rebellion against you. Uh, I'm not thinking that. <laughs> Like, like, brother, you know, you've you got to keep your wife in check here, okay? Just get down on your knees and pray for her because I, I'm seeing things right now that are, that are just, no. <laughs> no. No, no, praise the Lord. You've got a, a good wife. Amen. Amen. See, let's go down here a little bit. See, there should be no sense of dictatorship, but rather God delegates authority for the blessing and protection of those under authority so that they will become all that God wants them to be. Think about that for a moment. Indeed. Moreover, the one in authority is accountable to God for those under his authority. Now I'm speaking very generally here. I'm accountable to God for you. Indeed. The pastors I sat under accountable to God for the people under them. Indeed. Now, now this does not mean that the husband or husband must make every decision, but he is responsible for every decision made. You hear that? It doesn't mean that he must make every decision, but he's responsible for every decision made. Think about that. Indeed. For he will give an account. Wives, keep this in mind. When you find yourselves in disagreement with your husband, he is the head, so the buck stops with him. Stops with you. Indeed. Therefore, he will give, he will be the one giving an account for every decision made, whether they be good or bad. Think of Abraham and Sarah. There was a bad decision there. We're actually reaping the consequences of that decision today. The Middle East. That's why you've got the issues with the Jews and the Arabs. Because of that one bad decision. You know what? We're not patient. We're not patient to wait for God's promise. You, you know, you go on to my handmaid here and uh, Hagar and, uh, and, you know, we'll have a child. That was a big mistake Abraham made. See, if your husband is negligent with that responsibility, or if he abuses it for his own advantage, he and he alone will answer to God for it. It's that simple. Remember, ladies, it is not your duty, it is never your duty to try to change your husband. You will never do it. And I've heard this many times. I can change him. I love him. I can change him. No, you will not. Only Jesus can change him and transform him. 
after explaining the analogy as Christ is the head of the church, Paul adds this, and he is the Savior of the body. Indeed. Christ's headship over the church meant that he gave himself on the cross to save his people from their sins. Now, while Christ's role as Savior is unique, there is an analogy. Husbands must sacrificially give themselves in love for their wives. It's a self-sacrificial love. Are you taking note? Husbands, are you taking note? I repeat, you must sacrificially give yourselves in love for your wives. For husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a taller order. You see, the feminists get all hung up on verse 22 through 24. But they fail to read on to verse 25 and truly comprehend it. You know why? Because they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. They don't know what self-sacrificial love really means. You see, the Muslims can't claim that. They love their wives to submit. But nowhere in the Quran or the Hadith are the husbands commanded to love their wives. Not once. Husbands must use their headship to protect and bless their wives. Never to abuse them. I'm not talking about physical abuse, by the way. Verbal abuse. Don't put your wife down. They ought to use their headship. They ought not to use, rather, their headship to bully their wives. Nor are they to use it as a tool to manipulate them either. But rather, their headship ought to be used to protect them. Amen? Amen. Amen. See, wives need to be assured that they will not be harmed. No. But rather, they ought to be assured that they are cared for. They ought to have that assurance that they are greatly loved by their husbands. Especially when they submit to such godly husbands. Husbands who abdicate their God-given authority in the home leave their wives spiritually unprotected. Think about that. Husbands who abdicate their God-given authority in the home leave them spiritually protected. And sadly, this is the case in most homes today, even supposed Christian homes. I wonder how many Christian men in our Baptist churches have abdicated their role as head of the home. I wonder. Now, wives, to submit biblically to your husband, you must be in submission to the Lord. This is imperative. If you're unable to submit unto the Lord, you will never, and I repeat, never submit to your husband. No. Indeed. This is vital. And you must recognize that your husband is, in fact, your head or your authority. He is, obviously, under Christ. But in the, con in the context of the home, he is. Now, you may say, you've got to be kidding me. Really? Yes, ladies. Your husband, in fact, is your head. This is not my personal opinion, but rather a biblically stated fact. For God hath spoken. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now concerning the biblical headship of the husband, I would like to quote an interesting article here from Lori Alexander. She goes by the moniker of the transformed wife. I like much of what she writes. I don't agree with everything that she writes. And like anything written by man, you need to exercise the sermon, or woman in this case. But I like what she writes here. Was the headship of men over their wives inbuilt in creation? That's the title of it. Is there something coming in here? Oh, I'm hearing something. All right. I will read. Was the headship of men over their wives inbuilt in creation? It's an interesting article. And she says, recently I read, quote, A Severe Mercy by Sheldon Vanuken. Sheldon was a pagan 
and married a pagan wife. Their goal, sorry, let me just move over here. Their goal was to be deeply in love always and do anything it took to stay this way, including not having children. Typical pagan. They believed life was about love and beauty, so they went about, their, they went about living their lives seeking this. What vanity. They met some Christians who they became very close to and realized that these Christians were the happiest and kindest people they have, they have ever met. They eventually became strong believers, yet Sheldon's wife, Davy, what a name, died in her 30s from a strange illness that ate away her liver. Wow. Here's one insight he had about their marriage after death. Quote, One insight from the past which I might have closed my mind to, but for Christianity, was not quite so shocking as it would have been if Davy in that last year or so had not seemed increasingly to accept Paul's dictum on the relationship of husband and wife, that the man is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. It goes on to say here, although we should fiercely have denied it, except perhaps for Davy in that last year, I saw that I had exercised a sort of headship in the sense of the initiatory or leadership role that was accepted, even desired by Davy, without either of us being aware of it. It had been loving and gentle. All decisions were discussed. There was never a hint of command, and yet, despite mutual tenderness and deference, it was, I now saw there, that veiled and loving headship. Quote, he says here, we eschewed or eschewed husbandry authority. Is it eschewed or eschewed? Eschewed? Eschewed, right? I need, my, I need my grammarians to come to my rescue here. Eschewed? Okay. Eschewed husbandry authority from the, fir, from the first. Davy was combative and intelligent. We believed everything a modern feminist would have urged. Yet something of headship had all, all along been there. Having known one woman deeply, having myself made every effort to see that a woman's eyes, I could now, with, with a woman's eyes, he says, not to see with a woman's eyes, I apologize, I could now believe that my subtle headship or Davy's acceptance of it was merely conditioning. Now I wrote to her about it, wondering without decision whether, despite all feminist denial, such a relationship were not inbuilt in the creation and effectively denied, which after all, we lovingly, deep, loving deeply, had not been able to do only at a heavy cost of love. That's what he said. So Lori Alexander says here, was the headship of the husband over his uh, was the headship over his wife in built in the creation? Children know their fathers are the head of the family. Even their wives don't acknowledge this. Even their wives don't acknowledge this. How do I know? She says if a child has a godly father, the chances of the children growing up to be believers is extremely high. If a child has a godly mother only, the chances of the children growing up to be believers is low, low. Children can see that their fathers are generally bigger, stronger, and with louder, deeper voices than their, than their mothers. This is inbuilt from creation. And by the way, I'll add to this, this is why really it's a husband's role to primarily discipline and correct the children. There is an authority with that deep commanding voice. And not just the voice, obviously it's, it's the whole attitude behind it and, and character. And this is in Bill from Creation. Yes, women will effectively deny all of this because they have been taught that authority by their husbands is oppression. Yet they trot off to work each day to be under authority of their bosses and they obey the speed limit since they are under the authority of the government, yet they be, that, yet forget being under authority the, under the authority of the one of the one they chose to love all of their days, if you will. And I apologize for uh, the way I'm quoting it. Actually, I'm wondering about the speed limit thing now. There's some women that are more aggressive on the road than men. <laughs> You've noticed that, eh, brother? You know, you'll be driving there like weaving through traffic. That's really a woman in that car. <laughs> really? <laughs> Satan convinced Eve that authority to God was evil. And he went to her instead of Adam for a good reason. This is how he was able to deceive her and have her eat the forbidden fruit. Satan will always work on the weaker vessel. This is why God has actually commanded you to be the head of your home. This is why God calls a man 
to the ministry. Over that pagan festival, we saw a bunch of limp-wristed men. It was the women in the front of that battle. And I like, as, as Luke Keenly um, observed, right, when we preach... They can ins we, 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 make sure we let them know, you can insult the preacher. We don't care about that. You can insult, insult us, belittle us, but you're not going to insult my Savior. Whereas, their attitude is, you can insult my Odin, but you better not insult me. <laughs> right? You can't call them effeminate. Yeah, you, you call, what? Effeminate? <laughs> it's something about that word effeminate. By the way, it's biblical. <laughs> look, look, you could insult you could you could insult my small small G God. But I, I have to draw the line when you call me effeminate. You can't insult me. <laughs> That's a different literally you see that it played out. You see the inverted roles there. <laughs> Baby Lynn's laughing. It's true. You better not insult me. Insult my gods. You can put them down. <laughs> you better not insult me. I, I can't handle that. I can't handle any... Mr. Queer! <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> no, I don't think... <laughs> it's one of... I don't know, like, some of the things that we say sometimes. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, boy. Let me just go back here. I want to make sure I'm not going to... Uh... See, Satan convinced Eve that the authority to God, that authority to God, rather, was evil. And he went to her instead of Adam for a good reason. This is how he was able to deceive her and have her eat the forbidden fruit. You see, Satan is actively convincing women that submission to their husbands is evil, yet many willingly submit to his wicked agenda of feminism and the destruction, or that has led to the destruction of the marriage and family unit, or of marriage. He fights against everything that God tells us is good. So yes, the headship of husbands over their wives was inbuilt from creation since the purpose for God creating Eve was to be a help me to her husband, she says. And the Bible says that. This God-ordained role, this is a God-ordained role and it is good. For those who want to argue that being a help me didn't mean that Adam was in authority, oh yes it did! In 1 Timothy 2.13, it was told that one, one of the reasons uh, Timothy was told that we, or we are rather told that one of the reasons that women are not to usurp authority over men nor teach them was because Adam was created first, then the woman. God made him first and had, him, and had Adam name all the animals before he created Eve. But God saw that it wasn't good for him to be alone. So he made him a help me for him out of his rib. Adam was in authority over her, and this is why women are to learn in silence with all subjection. Not a popular point. In fact, I know one preacher who he he, he doesn't have women give testimonies in the church for that very reason, because there's a fine line be between giving a testimony and sermonizing. And often that testimony Will, will, uh, will lead to sermonizing. It harkens all the way back to creation, she says, and has nothing to do with cultural norms. Even Jesus submitted to God the Father. Doesn't mean he was inferior to him, but he submitted. Authority is good. Ladies, she says, or women, authority is good. I'll extend on that. Gentlemen, authority is good. Don't allow anyone to tell you anything, she says, differently. Don't let anyone to tell you anything differently. Without leaders and people in authority, you have chaos. There is chaos. Indeed. We're looking at the headship 
of the husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Brings me to the third point. Again, the two points, the first two points. A wife who is submitted to her husband will first be submitted unto the Lord. A wife who is submitted to her husband will recognize his headship. And a wife who is submitted to her husband understands what biblical submission is and what it is not. She, make, she can make that clear distinction. Why? Because she is submitted unto the Lord. And if she's submitted unto the Lord, she'll be submitted to the headship of her husband. Now, there are seven characteristics of biblical submission. See, biblical submission is the attitude and action of willingly and wholeheartedly respecting, yielding to, and obeying the authority of another. This definition applies to all of the spheres of authority, to God Himself, to human government, to church government. We're not talking about, uh, you know, state church here. You know what I'm talking about here. Apply uh, to wives, to husbands, children, to parents, it applies, and workers to employers. Yes. It includes our attitude because it is not to be forced, but willing and wholeheartedly. Applied to wives, it includes respecting and reverencing your husband. Now, submission involves respecting your husband. It involves reverencing him. In closing chapter 5, Paul sums up his counsel by reiterating the fact that the husband is to love his wife. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she what? Reverence her husband. You've got verse 25, right? Husbands, love your wife. And again it says here, so love his wife even as himself. See, it's easy to love yourself. You often hear, oh, I hate myself. No, you don't. You may hate the way you look. You may hate the way you feel. You may covet something else. Usually it's because you see something in your eyes. It's, if, it's, if it's something vain in terms of how you look, a hairstyle, or how a particular movie star looks, so you want to look like that movie star, although they're probably on adrenochrome and everything else there, whatever, but I'm not getting into that. <laughs> but... <clears throat> So you see an ideal of what beauty is in your eyes and you, don't, and you don't meet that. That doesn't mean you hate yourself. In fact, you love yourself too much that you want to aspire to be something you're not. Indeed. So the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah. It's a characteristic of the last days, right? Second Timothy chapter 3 it says that, verse 2. In fact, it's the first, it's the first characteristic there. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. We're living in that day, the selfie generation. I find women, although men are bad, women are the worst. You've got these glamour pics. I think one preacher, I think it was Stacy Shiflett, he, was, he, he, uh, he mentioned something about, oh no, it wasn't that. Was it, was it Spencer Smith? I think it was Spencer Smith. I get mixed up between the... But he, was, he brought up that point. Like he's, like he's noticing far too... Uh, married far too many w married women with these glamour pics, like I mean glamour, like you know, <clears throat> and that speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. There's probably problems in that marriage, and so on and so forth. So rather than saying that the wife must submit to her husband, Paul says that she must reverence him. In other words, she must literally fear him. A godly fear, you have to understand that. She is to reverence, venerate, to treat with deference or reverential obedience. A wife is to submit unto her own husband as unto the Lord. A large part of submission involves respect. Wives are not to put your husband's down. A wife is not to put him down. A wife is not to attack him. She is not to speak ill of him to others in public. 
And boy, have I heard this in the workplace over and over again, belittling their husbands, complaining about their husbands, especially when I, when I was working behind the membership counter for a time being. I like being a receiving, so I don't have to deal with that nonsense. Indeed. Her children need to see that their mother reveres and respects her father. She ought not to undermine his authority and headship in any way. She ought to be sensitive of what she says and how she acts and behaves. She may not agree with him, but she never should never come across as undermining that authority and headship because the children will see it indeed. And now his effectiveness in obeying the Lord and assuming that role of headship now has been undermined. And in fact, this, I can make a really a parallel here in this church with a gentleman that we've had in the church here. And I saw it early. He's not here now. And quite frankly, as Dr. Lamar would say, there's some people you need to pray out. You need to pray out. And it's actually a blessing that they're not here. Because I saw that he was insubordinate and he had an issue with authority and submitting to it. And you know what it did? It undermined the, the, our, actually our ministry. It, under, it was deeply undermining. And in fact, it was vexing to the point I knew I was vexed. It got me to question myself. Is it me? Like I was questioning myself. Is it me? Am I going too far? Am I, am I, is it maybe my insecurity here? All these things, I was beginning to question myself. No, there's an undermining. You know, God has given me, as the pastor, a role, really, or an office of leadership and headship, really, in a sense. And uh, if that's undermined, your effectiveness of your ministry will be undermined. It will be ineffective. See, Satan can bring a man in to render that ministry ineffective. So now you, basically what you have is no head now, nobody leading. Because that, the one who is leading is being undermined. Then I start to question myself, well, but what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong here? Indeed. I just made that parallel. The husband's headship and authority must never be undermined. And the children will clearly see this when it is. They will. They will see it. A wife needs to make sure she's on her husband's team and, they will, and be there to cheer him on. If he does make a mistake, and he will, listen ladies, Sister Baby Lynn, he will, then she can gently correct him, she can, but she must always assure him of her loyalty and love. Wives, your husband needs this. Be sensitive of this. Often that will be a driving force in enabling him to carry on and move forward. When your wife has got your back, you can move forward. Submission includes the desire to please the one over you. Marriages that are in tr trouble often stem from the fact that both spouses are competing with one another. That's what feminism has done. It's created a competition in that relationship rather than one that ought to be a uh, complementarian, if you will. So they are competing with one another rather than complementing one another. You see, rather than seeking to please her husband, the wife is always trying to win. It happens. There are wives out there that want to make him pay for what he has done to hurt her. But submission means that you want him to be happy. You want to please him. If he likes a particular meal, you fix it. And you fix it often. If he likes the house to be neat, you try to keep it that way. You don't punish him by making them unhappy. You please him in every 
way possible. That's not a popular message today. By the way, if she's not doing that, you don't demand it, husbands. We're talking about the godly order here. She will do this, by the way, if she is first submitted to the Lord. Well, I ain't going to have ain't no man tell me what to do. By the way, they usually have that kind of a voice, too. <laughs> no man's going to tell me what to do, Norma. <laughs> you see, ladies, at times this may be hard. But keep in mind, God has ordained you to be His helpmeet. He's ordained you as the helpmeet of your husband. You are there to complement him. You are there to complete him. Indeed. Amen? Amen? See, submission means not subverting your husband's will and desires through deception, through manipulation, and through whining. How many murmuring and uh, complaining wives are there? My husband, you know, I, I want him to take out the garbage and it's still there. Well, husbands, you better be taking out the garbage. But wives don't complain about it all the time. As one preacher said, I've seen wives who put on a veneer of submission to their husband's face, but when they go behind his back and use subversive tactics to get what they want, women... See, God has is, 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 is equipped women with that power of persuasion. And there's a godly means of employing that. And often that's really to, to guide him and help him make the right decision. But women often don't do that. They use it. They are actually manipulative. You know what? Just to bring it to a base point, I've seen that with my own daughter. I've got to keep her in check. I love you, but I see. I, but I have to keep it in check. I say, you know what, Yell? Little ladies, don't behave that way. Right? No. See, I want to train my little daughter to be a godly young woman. I really want to, between my wife and I, we're going to train her that she'll be, she'll be a godly wife to a good husband. Indeed. This is why the emphasis is really to be a keeper at home, to learn, to be a, key, a homemaker. You know what, ladies? Even more so than going to Bible college. I really want, that's, that's my primary goal. I'd rather her not go to Bible college because you know what? The Bible says to learn from their husbands. But if you look at the scriptures, just at what they say, the wives are to learn from their husbands. That doesn't mean you don't study the Bible and you're some kind of dunce. You're not. But there is a godly order, and we've really perverted that. So women ought not to use subversive tactics, manipulative tactics. They ought not to whine or nag him until they get something done or until they get some peace. Or until, rather, he gets, uh, or until he rather capitulates. That is not submission. There are women who nag their husbands to the point where he just can't take it, so he gives in. Like he's been so broken down that he just gives in. And what he ends up doing is escaping through various means. It could be escaping through, uh, through a study. Just lock himself in his study, you know, dwelling in the corner of, a, of uh, the corner top of the house. That's what that is. In today's vernacular, it's the man cave. That's what it is. Submission means responding to your husband as a leader, as leader. Many husbands feel threatened and incompetent when it comes to leading their wives. If their feeble attempts to... Uh, uh, lead with or, or attempts lead with criticism or apathy, they won't try again. Wives, if your husband is sincerely trying to fulfill his leadership role in the home and in your marriage, you need to encourage him at all costs, even if his leadership is heavily flawed, and it will be. It will be. If your husband makes a plan, or he proposes an idea about something, even concerning the family, it could be something big, please avoid criticizing the idea or plan. 
if you are compelled to criticize, then make sure your criticism is constructive and not destructive. Don't make it a personal attack. There are many women who make it a personal attack. You have to understand, I'm dealing exclusively with the women here. I will get to the men. If your husband dares to share something on his heart with you, or if he shares a fear that is nagging deep within him, then listen to him attentively and sensitively and thank him for it. Ladies, be responsive and not resistant. Submission does not imply the inferiority of the wife to her husband. That's what many will claim. Well, that means you just believe that we're inferior. No, we don't. Now, you are inferior in some cases. Men are stronger. You're the weaker vessel. But this is not the issue at hand. If we examine the Godhead, for instance, the Son is not inferior to the Father because He submits to Him even in eternity. Indeed. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Don't turn there, but mark it down. When all things shall be subdued unto Him, then shall the Son also Himself be what? Subject unto Him that put all things unto Him that God may be all in all. The mere thought of the Son being inferior to the Father would, that would be absolutely heretical at best. He's not. You see, a godly husband is, a, is to be a good manager of his household. He is to be one that ruleth well over his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Now, of course, that's a qualification for both a pastor and a deacon, but we can make an extended application as well. Why? Because if you see that in the pastor and his family, you're going to have children. That's what you're going to aspire for your family. A good manager utilizes and praises the strength of those he manages. If a wife is better at something than the husband is, and she will be, a wise husband will recognize that gift and let her use it for the common good. Amen? Again, it's in the context of the order of the home. And often what my wife is better than me at, I can't do. And it's usually a God, it's really a woman's role. And I've used this, ex, you know, this illustration many times. When my wife, when she had just given birth, literally a couple days after giving birth to Isaiah, she had the worst case of sciatica in the piriformis she, her muscles. She could not even walk, get out of bed. That's how bad it was. How long was it like that you were in that state? It was a few months, but you were increasing to get better. But at least for a month there, I know for a fact. Uh, we had the ladies from uh, Toronto Baptist Church. They would take a day off and they would come and spend time when I was at work. Because eventually I had to go, go to work. But for a period of time there, I was literally playing mother. And I did a lousy job. Again, I dressed these young children. They were younger, obviously. They had much younger. Little, little, to little, not toddlers, but young. I think Jacob was five. No, he wasn't even five yet. He was four and a half. Wow. And... Um, you know, I, I, I make basic, you know, just cooking that. And I'm not a good cook, but enough. A simple cook, but the way I dressed them, she would just like, she saw how they were dressed. She said, I can't believe that you're allowed. That, that, that's his home clothes. This is what you wear to go out. All right, whatever. <laughs> apparently, there's a big difference between what you wear in the home and what you wear out. Yo, know, there's a different pair of uh, pants that you wear in the home. What was that? Yeah. Who is that? Pink, pink yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A pink negligee, yeah. Oh, don't forget the pink t-shirt and the pink kilt. <laughs> I don't know how you can walk in public with that. I honestly don't. It's not just that he's wearing a woman's garment. They go the extra mile and actually wear a pink garment. Like, I'm going to wear pink. And, and, and even the extra mile with the, hu with the husband there, the man... It's not just like a woman's garment. It's something that she would wear in the privacy of her bedroom for her husband. Out in public. I mean, you couldn't get more inverted than that. 
<laughs> yeah, you, you got me there, man. That, that, that was it. You know, I was wounded, especially in front of my children. Come on, man. <laughs> it's laughable, isn't it, really? How ridiculous. I mean, you know, I know I'm belaboring this, but just look. Just, just do me a favor. I have, a, I have a, a, a side view mirror here. Just take a look at yourself for a moment. Just stand back and examine yourself. Being called effeminate, first of all, is apt, and it's the least of your problems. Indeed. The wife needs to truthfully, needs truthfully to communicate her dissatisfaction with her husband's insensitivity or aloofness. Sorry, I went too far there. I gotta go back. The manager you like okay, so I'm gonna hear. Submission does not imply passivity. No. A wife can be submissive and still actively try to still actively try to influence her husband for God. Absolutely. The wife whose husband is disobedient to the Lord is not told to be passive and not influence not influence him indeed. But she is to possess a meek and quiet spirit. You see, all scripture, including the command to speak the truth in love, applies to wives as well as husbands. A submissive wife needs to lovingly and sorry, lovingly admonish her husband if he is in sin. So if it's an issue of that he's in sin, she needs to lovingly admonish him. Now she can't she ought not to obviously approve of that. But again, ladies, you can't control. You can't control him. All you can do is just let him see your godly living, your conversation. She, she needs truthfully to communicate her dissatisfaction with her husband's insensitivity, insensitivity or aloofness. She may need to express her opinions vigorously so her husband knows exactly what she thinks, but she must do so meekly. Without honest communication, a marriage cannot grow in intimacy, no. Submission means that after a thorough, honest sharing of thoughts and feelings, if there is still disagreement, the wife, listen to this, the wife must go along with the husband's decision. As long as that decision, and I emphasize this, is not simple. She may vehemently disagree with him, but she must go along with him. She must support him from henceforth. Failure to do so, ladies means that you are in rebellion against God. When you're not submitting, you're in rebellion. Indeed. Now, if I'm looking you in the face, I'm not saying that you are. If you are, it's between you and God. And when you're in rebellion, it will further cause disharmony and discord in your marriage. Now, I will say this, that when my wife makes a suggestion or perhaps brings something to light that I may have overseen, I rarely overrule her. Absolutely. Now, obviously, when she makes a suggestion, she's not commanding me to do something. But often she, she may bring something that I maybe have been, may have been a blind spot to me or for me. And you know what? I'll take heed. She's got something there. You know what she uh, mentioned, actually? You know, we're talking in the van today. And she said with these pagans, and kind of their attacks, she says, be careful, because one thing they might want to do is infiltrate. They, want, they might want to infiltrate. And, you know, Satan's more than able to send somebody that will infiltrate, that's a witch, mm -hmm. uh, maybe was brought up in a Christian home, maybe, maybe came from a Baptist church, where the King James Bible was preached. They know, the, they know our vernacular. They know, our, they, know, they know how we speak our manners, our mannerisms and that, and they'll seek to conform, uh, com, or at least seek, uh, seek to convey, convey that, that they're a true child of God. So she said, just be aware of that, that that could happen. And I thought that was wise. And I told my wife, I said, you know what, you have a good point there. Absolutely. You have a good point. 
See, I rarely overrule my wife if she's given me a suggestion, which I often agree with her suggestions. I will follow her advice, not her command, her advice. I will follow it because I actually agree with her, indeed. Now, submission does not require a wife to bury her spiritual gifts, no. You see, there are many gifted women in the Bible and throughout church history who have been greatly used of God. For instance, Priscilla is often mentioned before her husband, Aquila, or Aquila. She was probably the prominent one in helping Apollo straighten out his theology. Who knows? Although I do believe her husband led. Timothy's grandmother and mother, they played key roles in training him in the scriptures. In fact, the father wasn't present there. It was his mother and grandmother. They were instrumental in preparing him to eventually become a pastor. You see, women have a huge ministry in influencing their children for the Lord. In fact, I would say my wife has a greater influence on my, influence on my children than I do because she's with them as a keeper of the home. This is why God commands you to be a keeper of the home. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Brings me to the fourth point. A wife who is submitted to her husband understands that her submission must be total. You hear that? This speaks of surrender. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. I want to see how far by God I'm going on here. I'm coming to a close soon. I want to draw your attention to the last phrase in this verse. In everything. In everything. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So what does this phrase mean, we ask? Or you may ask. And everything means that you cannot create loopholes to dodge the commandment. We're good at that. Our old nature often dictates that we will seek ways to dodge God's clear commandment or find excuses to explain away our, unwilling, our unwillingness to obey because we still want to do what we think is right in our own eyes. Many Christians are like this. On Wednesday, we're talking about the, the, uh, the feminist influence behind pants and dresses or pants on women. Many wives will say, I would submit to my husband if he could just love me as you've described, but how can I submit when he is so selfish and insensitive? Well, you know what? You still have to submit. Pray for him. You see, blaming the faults of their spouses is always the hardest and biggest hurdle to overcome in a marriage. When wives stop doing this and start focusing on their own responsibilities, there is hope. And everything includes submission in thoughts, words, and deeds. Submission and respect begin in your thought life. Wives, do you run down your husband and complain about his shortcomings? Or do you thankfully focus on his strength? Are your words encouraging and affirming? Are your deeds supportive and responsive? Are they? Now, in everything, does not include submission to sin. No. No. And everything does not mean that you say yes to every demand that, that submission only serves to foster, sorry, to every demand when that submission, rather, only serves to foster your husband's laziness and irresponsibility. Again, I'm going to repeat that. And everything does not mean that you say yes to every demand when that submission only serves to foster your husband's laziness and irresponsibility. Indeed. If your husband is dumping his responsibility on you or using you as a, as a slave to cater to his laziness, then you need to talk to him about it. Yeah. Yeah. He needs to be confronted meekly again and gently and graciously with his faults, with his, with his faults. Yet, 
in a firm manner. To allow him to go on in this sin is not to love him as Christ commands you to do in Ephesians 5.2. And everything does not mean yielding to criminal behavior, including threats or physical abuse. And if this is happening in any relationship here, well, if it's really serious, you need to call the police, but you need to talk to your pastor. And as well, talk to your pastor, and then we may need to have some counseling if that's the case. Indeed. Ladies, you don't need to submit to your husband's sin. If, you, if you're submitting to your husband, husband causes you to sin, and I'll go even further. Um, if your husband doesn't want you to go to church, you go to church. You go to church. That's submitting unto the Lord. Yeah. My wife uh, knew someone in her first church. Her husband forbade her to go to church. Even at gunpoint. It got to the point where it was at gunpoint. She went. And you know what? He got saved. He got saved. Now as I close, I must say that the command for wives to submit unto their own husbands as unto the Lord is not a public, popular subject, subject rather, to preach and teach, no. For many women, Christian women, this is a struggle. It is. I'm talking about Christian women. Especially when their husbands are not walking with the Lord, it's very hard. Why should I submit to my husband when, he's, when he won't even read his Bible? He won't open up his Bible. And I'm called to submit to that? Yes. Commit to him. You submit. Yes, you are. Ladies, you still need to submit. Where your husband is lacking, then pray for him. You can gently admonish him at times, but fervently pray for him. Don't blame your husband or wait for him to start loving you as he should. Instead, make that conscious decision to obey God by submitting to your husband in every area, even as the church is subject or, to, or is to submit to Christ. Now, if you're fighting this portion of Scripture, you're not submitting. And if you're not submitting, the world will not see Jesus Christ in you. No. Heavenly Father, I give Thee thanks for Thy Word. Lord, I pray, Lord, that there's, there's, there's many truths here contained therein. And I pray, Lord, it be applied by Thy people here. Lord, I pray, Lord, it serve to really strengthen them and, and edify, Lord. I pray, I pray that was an edifying message. Lord, we give thanks for the, for the time of fellowship that we're about to embark on, for the good food. And we ask that Thou would bless it, Lord, to our bodies. In Jesus' precious, holy, and wonderful name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>